and good morning to everybody signing in here on this Friday morning. And today, um, I'm particularly happy because we get to talk with an old friend and actually one of my, uh, well, I have somebody I respect very much for many years now, Dr. Donald Abrams. He's also a great friend to Commonweal, which hosts these calls as well. Um, so I'll just say by way of intro, I arrived in San Francisco in the mid 1980s out of public health school, graduate school, and by chance that was the time when a new pandemic was beginning. Uh, what came to be known as AIDS at that point, it wasn't even known yet what it was, but I was working for both the local medical association and the health department and UCSF trying to help coordinate the response here. And we were part of the epicenter, of course, of this. Uh, disease. And there were just a few people who I quickly got to know were becoming real leaders in this, not just locally, but nationally and internationally, for pioneering care and research and policy uh, on this. And Dr. Abrams was one of these. He was himself just out of training at uh, San Francisco General Hospital, our public hospital here, which became itself a center for leading research and, and uh, treatment as well. So uh, we have for many years now and uh, have worked together on some of these issues, but mostly I've just followed his lead on some of these as well. Uh, so good morning, Donald. Good morning, Steve. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. A pleasure. Before we dig into some of these issues, uh, there's a lot to talk about. I'd like to hear a little bit about yourself in terms of where you grew up and how you first found your way into medicine. Oh, good question. Yeah, I was born in New York and my family moved when I was five to Cleveland. Unclear why, uh, you know, my parents' families were all in New York and I never understood exactly why we moved to Cleveland. Uh, one of my aunts told me that was my father was offered a good job by my uncle Nick in Toledo. And I said, well, I thought uncle Nick was a racketeer, whatever that means. So anyway, my father had a degree from uh, NYU School of Journalism, but actually used it only peripherally and sold color television service contracts in Cleveland ultimately. Uh, so I come from a long line of uh, no doctors, uh, and my temple uh, folded after my bar mitzvah. They sort of wanted me to be a rabbi, but I always said making me a man was a hard act to follow. So when my temple folded, uh, I didn't proceed to a Hebrew high school. So I wasn't going to be a rabbi. And I don't know, my instincts just were that uh, medicine biology interested me and that medicine was probably what I was going to do. So I left Cleveland uh, for the first time to go to Brown University where I was in a seven year program that was going to lead to an MD degree. But uh, in the middle of my training, I went to Europe for my first time, came back and said, gee, I don't think I want to stay in Providence, Rhode Island for the rest of my life. So I dropped out of that program and tried to apply to medical schools. Everybody said, oh, you're not going to get in any place because you don't have any grades because Brown was very progressive and did away with grades. But I wound up getting into Stanford, so not too bad. And the rest is history. Stanford Medical School. Stanford Medical School after right. Brown. Yeah. And how did you first get an inkling of your chosen specialty? Well, that's a good uh, question. So Stanford... Uh, allows you to spend as much time there as you want. And I did spend a year in London. And before I went to London for that year, I really thought I was gonna be a psychiatrist. But uh, right before I went to London, uh, I spent time at McLean's Hospital, which is Harvard Psychiatric Hospital. And I was working in the uh, borderline unit where I was more accepted as a patient uh, than as a a medical student and I learned how to play backgammon and that's all I can say about that summer. Uh, then I went off to the Maudsley Hospital, which is the psychiatric institute in London. And I was disturbed that what we called schizophrenia, they called depression. And what we called depression, they called an adjustment reaction. So I said, 
gee, we're speaking the same language, but you know, they say this and we say that. And I think I need something that's a little bit more definitive or measurable. Um, so after Stanford, I uh, did my internship and residency at Kaiser in San Francisco. And uh, I really bonded to a lot of my patients who had uh, leukemia and cancers who were dying. And uh, I think for me, it had to do with my own sort of fear of death that I always say was sort of vibrated into me by my parents who lost uh, three of my four grandparents died from my birth to my second birthday. And my mother was 22 when I was born. So I think that uh, she lost both of her parents. And I, I feel that, you know, this sense of fear of losing people you love was sort of inculcated into me and, and I needed to sort of get over that. So by dealing with people who were at that transition, I found a lot of uh, gratification and actually wanted to be a hematologist. But uh, I got into my hematology fellowship at UCSF right as AIDS broke. And AIDS was cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma. So in the middle of my hematology oncology fellowship at UCSF, I, I changed my course a bit and stayed an extra year so I could get my boards actually in oncology instead of hematology. And you ended up staying here, in fact, and practicing and working out of San Francisco General, which really an epicenter for care and, and research there. Yeah, I mean, uh, the first year of my uh, hematology oncology fellowship, I had a young woman die of a very bizarre leukemia. And right after she died, her father, who was in the military, came and showed me his lab report, and he had an even more bizarre leukemia. So I said, oh, this is weird. This must be viral. So I did a lecture for the fellows um, on virally induced malignancy. And in the second year of your fellowship, you're supposed to work in a laboratory. And I really had no interest in working in a laboratory. But my uh, teachers or professors invited Harold Varmus uh, to my lecture on virally induced malignancies. And Harold, of course, with Mike Bishop, got the Nobel Prize for their work uh, on retroviruses. And uh, this began a, a conversation between Harold and myself, which ultimately led to me spending my second year of my fellowship, trying to work in his retrovirology lab. And again, this is right at the time that AIDS exploded. And uh, I really thought this was a retrovirus, uh, just from what I knew about retroviruses, learned working in the lab. And I tried to convince some of the 34 postdocs that were in the lab that this disease is caused by a retrovirus and you should help me uh, look at some of the tissues I'm bringing back from patients that I was seeing in clinic. And everybody said, oh, well, there's really no such thing as a human disease caused by a retrovirus. So, you know, you're wasting your time. So turned out that ultimately I was really unsuccessful in the lab. And I had, uh, was more interested in this syndrome of lymphadenopathy, persistent swollen lymph nodes that I had perceived in gay men at Kaiser. And I uh, established a, a cohort, a clinical trial observational study looking at 200 gay men with swollen glands to see if they were going to go on and get these more severe manifestations of what we still weren't calling AIDS yet, but uh, the Kaposi sarcoma and the pneumocystis. And, you know, that work made me think that, okay, I don't really have time to spend trying to extract DNA and RNA from lymph nodes, so I'm gonna go back to the clinic, and that's what I did. And that's when I moved from uh, UCSF to San Francisco General. Paul Volberding had become the first ever full-time oncologist at San Francisco General, and he had seen his first case of Kaposi's sarcoma, and he came to me and said, knowing that I was a gay man, uh, that you know you should get involved in this and ultimately I got moved over to General where all the action was. 
and the action was a real influx of patients with still somewhat mysterious uh, presentation. And, you know, from what you just said, it's a little bit, I don't know if irony is the right word, but you were trying to confront mortality as an oncologist, and then you get into HIV, where for quite a few years there, everything that was being done was not effective in terms of saving lives. Everybody was dying for quite a while. Yeah, and again, you know, from what I said earlier, I think, I think that was, uh, that called upon that skill that I relinquished when I wasn't going to be a rabbi to deal with people again in transition. And uh, also, you know, that need I had to get over my fear of losing people I loved, which again, you know, as a gay man, uh, I had four partners from age 25 to 39 and they all died. Only one of them with me in 1989, we were together for three years. He died at coming home hospice. And, you know, I think, I think after that I was, I was over it, you know, but yeah, we had a lot of loss. In fact, Clint, uh, my husband now 26 years, just yesterday was sitting in his chair. We have a refrigerator uh, that's full of pictures of dead people. <laughs> And Clint, whose birthday is, is Sunday, just started to cry about all the people that we've lost in our lives. And, you know, I don't know, it's true, we have, but I think in, in truth, that's, that's life. And Clint is the one that pointed out that my career in medicine has now been bookended by pandemics. And I find it very interesting, you know, how my reaction to the first was very different from my reaction to the second. Because in this pandemic, uh, my last two weeks of inpatient medicine attending on the wards at San Francisco General were scheduled to be August 4th to the 17th. And two weeks before that, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm 70. I'm, I'm not going to do this. Whereas in the other pandemic, I <laughs> jumped in head first. I mean, they were really very different diseases, very yin and yang, as it were. But sort of interesting to me, my response to HIV AIDS and my response to COVID-19 being so sort of diametrically opposed, but. Yeah, I've actually talked with Paul Wilberding about this as well, because, you know, this is similar bookended, as you say. Um, but, you know, on that issue, I mean, you're talking basically then there about occupational risk uh, too, you know, that's part of the problem with this one. That was a big deal in the very beginning of HIV when we didn't even know how it was transmitted, if it might be aerosolized, et cetera. So, I mean, I really think that uh, as, as with now, but there where we had one that was pretty much universally fatal, a lot of the people on the front lines were truly heroic in that. Um, and there was a lot of fear about what's going on here and are we all gonna get it, you know? Yeah, Paul and I spent many a conversation after we got home from work on the telephone saying, oh my God, you know, what is this? Are we, you know, before the virus was identified, you know, is, mm. are we going to get this? And I do remember a, a Christmas party I went to at Kaiser because I was still uh, working in the general medical clinic there. And uh, I, I was collecting lymph nodes uh, from people across the city and bringing them back to my lab in, in Harold Varmus's uh, enterprise and f storing them in a freezer. And, um, I had collected a lymph node from a Kaiser patient in liquid nitrogen. And uh, at the Christmas party, this woman was telling me that she had uh, melanoma. She had just been diagnosed and it was taken out. And I said, oh, and I showed her my hand. I had three purple spots on my palm. And I said, I think I have Kaposi's sarcoma. And, you know, I, you know, this is, and I, the next day I was working in the emergency room at Kaiser, again, moonlighting. And I looked at my hand and I still had these three purple spots. So I called Marcus Conant. I think it was a Sunday. And he said, come to my office. Marcus was the dermatologist who was the premier dermatologist. And so I met him at his office. He arranged to, to come in and see me on Sunday. And he looked at my hand and I thought he would reassure me, but instead he took pictures of my hand. And I said, oh my God. Uh, he said, if it doesn't go away in a week, then I'm going to do a biopsy. Well, suddenly I remembered that probably 
when I was carrying the canister of liquid nitrogen, some had splashed onto my hand and those three purple spots were actually liquid nitrogen burns and they, they went away. Yeah. But, you know, living with a man for three years who I knew had AIDS and very advanced AIDS, uh, I never got tested during that three year period because if I found out that I had become positive for HIV, I didn't want to blame him. So only after he died uh, could I bring myself to get tested. And at the time I was seeing a psychiatrist because of the loss and dealing with all that. And I let him order the lab test. And I remember walking to his office and he opens the door like the psychiatrist and looks down at the floor. He says, how are you? And I said, you tell me. And he said, you're negative. And I said, okay, <laughs> adios. I didn't need him anymore. So that was the end of that. So a lot of loss though. We did suffer a lot of loss. Yeah, well, I don't think anybody, <clears throat> excuse me, anybody who wasn't here in that time really can understand. I remember, you remember one of the papers had it in and it basically became all obituaries, you know, every week. And uh, it, it was just astounding really. Um, one of the uh, other things you quickly got into was research in this regard. And I think maybe even how we met in person was uh, you began a community consortium of physicians who uh, were doing research for HIV and we hosted that at the Medical Association. And so um, what do you think are the, your most significant uh, it, it contributions in this regard to HIV research that came out of that? Well, I think you bring up a, a, a good uh, reminiscence here. The, Paul Volberding was called to a meeting with Diane Feinstein. Uh, the goal of the meeting was to make sure that San Francisco General didn't become just an AIDS hospital uh, because there was a risk that every patient admitted was going to have HIV AIDS. And that, you know, since we are a teaching hospital of the university, that wouldn't have, it would be like if everybody had diabetes, that wouldn't be a very broad spectrum. So. So Paul came back from that meeting and he said, you know, these are all your friends from the gay doctors organization. So why don't you start meeting with this group and figure out how we could sort of make sure that we don't get overwhelmed with these patients so that we could refer them to their uh, hospitals if they get sick. That, those were the days where people had private practices in medicine. So, so yeah, so we called together this group and San Francisco <coughs> General being the county hospital and these people being community physicians, we called it the County Community Consortium. Uh, ultimately, we dropped county because people couldn't remember what those three C's were. And we actually became uh, the first community-based clinical trials group in the country dealing with HIV AIDS. And I guess one of my contributions was that that then grew into a network, one that was funded by the American Foundation for AIDS Research and one that was funded by the NIH through the NIAID. And that's how I became a, a good friend of Tony Fauci because he was in charge of our network, uh, more or less. There were people below him that were more closely involved. But uh, you know, establishing a community-based clinical trial uh, network across the country, I think, I don't know that I did all of it, but for me, what it did for our colleagues in San Francisco, a lot of gay men and women, who went into internal medicine or family practice thinking that the most severe thing that they would ever treat would be syphilis or gonorrhea. Now dealing with all these young men who are dying, I think it brought together people for a group therapy, if you will. I mean, we educated each other about this new disease, but we also could come together once a month at the medical society and just be together and share the, the sadness and share uh, the loss. And another thing that we did first was uh, we, I had a scientific advisory committee and I had an executive board. And this was at the time that ACT UP was becoming uh, popular in San Francisco. And uh, there was a time when there was a, a call for, yeah, I think it was when the NIH wanted to fund community-based clinical trial program. And ACT UP and some of the other uh, activists felt that community-based meant based in the HIV community, whereas we thought it meant community physicians. So 
they were going to apply for the same grant we were. And uh, we developed, we thought it would be a good idea then to bring these community activists into the consortium. So we established a community advisory board and that was made up of patients and also uh, the activist community. And that was a first. You know, we, Paul and I wrote that up in the Hastings Review of Medical Ethics because it was a new concept to establish a, a board that include people dealing with the disease. And that's become sort of popular too. Uh, so, you know, I, I did a lot of uh, clinical trials in prevention of opportunistic infections. We did an inhaled pentamidine trial that was one of the first to try to prevent that infection. We try to prevent all the infections. We did a number of those uh, studies. Uh, again, I also defined this subset of patients with persistent generalized lymphadenopathy and described them as being a group at risk to develop the more severe manifestations of HIV AIDS and also was one of the people who contributed specimens to Robert Gallo's lab at the National Cancer Institute that he used uh, to first describe uh, HTLV3 or the AIDS retrovirus uh, back in 1985. So yeah, I, I you know, I just moved, I just retired and left my office at Zuckerberg San Francisco General that I've been in for 37 years. And it required packing a lot of boxes, which I donated uh, to the university library archivist. But, you know, I would look at this stuff that I did in the 80s and I said, wow, <laughs> I didn't remember and I was pretty impressed. <laughs> well, yeah, and some of these papers you're, you're being published in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine and so forth. This, this was, uh, you know, very important stuff. So about 15 years after AIDS was first appearing, you finally got some effective treatment with protease inhibitors and such. And um, in the mid uh, 90s, it was very striking. My, my main memory there, I was at Zen Hospice then, so we, and it was mostly AIDS patients. And to see the, uh, the AIDS percentage of the patients kind of empty out rather suddenly, uh, it was really something. It was very striking. Um, and you kind of changed your direction after that as well uh, in terms of your focus from doing mostly or all AIDS care into a broader sense, right? Well, uh, I think it, still in 96, uh, I was still pretty much involved in the AIDS world. Uh, uh, what happened was in 1992, uh, Rick Doblin, who's the president of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, uh, saw that Brownie Mary or Mary Rathbun uh, had gotten arrested baking cannabis brownies, or as Clint would prefer me to say, marijuana. We have a big uh, controversy here at home whether cannabis or marijuana is racist right. or Eurocentric, but that's another issue. Anyway, Mary Rathbun was being arrested for baking brownies uh, for our patients at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. And Rick Doblin sent a letter to the director of research in the AIDS program saying that a study showing the beneficial effects of marijuana should come from Brownie Mary's institution as if she were our dean. So Mark Jacobson uh, got the letter at first, one of my ID colleagues, and he brought it to me saying, gee, this is something that maybe you and the community consortium should be interested in. So I said, okay, you know, I went to college in the 60s. So uh, that began sort of my interest in plants as medicine. And uh, that ultimately took me to the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado, a month after I had done my first ever jury duty and came home and said, I want to go to law school. But in Telluride, I met Andrew Weil, uh, who described a two-year online distance learning fellowship you could do with his program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. And I said, uh-huh, I don't want to go to law school. I want to do that. So I did. And then when I finished that, that's when I sort of changed my career direction from HIV AIDS more to integrative oncology. Mm -hmm. How do you define integrative oncology? 
Well, that's a good question. I, I say integrative oncology is the evidence informed combination of complementary therapies with conventional therapy uh, to benefit the whole person, mind, body, and spirit living with cancer. It is patient-centered and relationship-based medicine. Mm -hmm. So this involves a broader range of pharmacology yeah. by definition, I think, too, right? Well, I, yeah, pharmacology is one way to put it. Uh, a lot of what we do in integrative healthcare is non-pharmacologic. Yeah, ever. again, uh, Clint, my husband, is a macrobiotic chef and changed my diet 26 years ago. And when I took my fellowship, which is an online two-year distance learning program, uh, I would be reading about nutrition for the first time because we didn't really learn about nutrition at Stanford Medical School. And I would say, oh my God, honey, you're right. You're right. And he said, I know, because <laughs> I didn't know any of this. And really, this has become my passion now in nutrition and cancer. Uh, but uh, in addition to nutrition, uh, I tell patients that I see at the Osher Center that cancer is like a weed and other people are taking care of their weed because I'm not their primary oncologist. I say, it's my job to work with the garden and to make your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. And I do that by looking to see how you fertilize the garden. That is what you eat and what supplements you take. So supplements are also, you know, an area of my interest, and that is more almost pharmaceutical because they're things mainly people take by mouth. But physical activity and weight control are also really important. And we know that physical activity decreases the risk of a number of malignancies, and patients with various cancers who are physically active do much better than those who aren't. And then the other big focus is really on stress. I see a lot of people when I say, tell me your story to a new patient who they weave a story as if stress caused their cancer. I don't think stress in and of itself causes cancer, but stress, which is epinephrine or adrenaline, kills your lymphocytes, the building block cells of the immune system, and stress is cortisol, a steroid hormone, which is an immune suppressant. So decreasing stress is important. In the old days, when people could be physically close to each other, massage was a good thing to do, uh, Reiki, all of those energy medicine things. I like yoga for stress, physical activity. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of traditional Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine is all about expelling evil and supporting good. Modern Western medicine really focuses on expelling evil. When people come to see me, I try to support good, but when you go to traditional Chinese medicine, they do both at the same time, but from a different angle. So they won't say you have stage four estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. They're gonna say you have decreased spleen qi and increased kidney yang, and they'll treat that. And then at the end of my uh, questioning of a patient before I used to examine him in the old days, I would ask them three questions. What brings you joy? What are your hopes and where does your strength come from? And one husband thought I was interviewing his wife for Miss America. He said, what is this? But then I, I met a woman at a conference uh, who told me that her husband had died a few years earlier. And she said, you know, when we came to see you and you asked him those three questions, he realized that even though he was that far on his path, that he still did have joy, hope, and strength, and that really changed the rest of his life. So that's what I do in integrative oncology. It's not alternative. I don't see people, I do see some people, but I tell them this isn't what I do. People who want to eschew uh, Western conventional cancer care in favor of you know, high dose cannabis or apricot seeds or hyperthermia or one of those things that, you know, don't really work. Uh, what I do is integrate complementary and conventional care because after all, I am a conventional oncologist. In the, with respect to that being a conventional oncologist, have you had uh, 
resistance, skepticism, uh, obstacles put in your way by the mainstream in medicine, both your immediate colleagues and otherwise in, in integrating this? You know, it's, it's a very good question. When I first started, most of the patients who came to see me at the Osher Center in 2005 found me on Andrew Weil's website. But now, 15 years later, my colleagues call and say, gee, can't you see this patient sooner than three months? We really would like you to see the patient. I, I, I believe that even though we can't do a randomized placebo-controlled trial of integrative uh, oncology versus not, uh, that my colleagues uh, at the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center have come to appreciate that patients that we co-manage may do better uh, than patients that they manage alone. Just like I've come to believe that patients that are seen by a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner do better than patients that just see me and their primary oncologist alone. So yeah, there still are people who are, you know, naysayers and think that we're all woo and, and charlatans, but uh, we have a society for integrative oncology. There are a number of uh, journals that publish uh, integrative uh, cancer care. I'm one of the editors of the NCI PDQ Integrative Alternative and Complementary Therapies website, which is a very uh, good website. Uh, and of course, Commonweal uh, has the Beyond uh, Cancer, uh, Beyond Conventional Cancer Therapies website as well. So there are resources available and there is uh, an increasing database. Again, uh, oncologists, are the most evidence demanding of all medical specialists because we deal with a serious disease and we use pretty potent treatments. So <clears throat> we really demand evidence. Andrew Weil has always said that the degree of evidence should be directly proportional to the potential for the intervention to do harm. So if I'm gonna say, take this new chemotherapy, your hair is gonna fall out, you're gonna vomit for three days, and your bone marrow is gonna be suppressed, you're gonna say, where's the evidence that it works? But if I'm gonna say, why don't you get a massage twice a month and eat more blueberries and broccoli, how much evidence do I really need? So, and plus it's very hard to do placebo controlled blueberries. So, you know, that's why I say what we do is evidence informed. So you don't feel that the imperative to be evidence-based is is really compromised in, in the work that you do in integrative oncology. Well, I think it, you know, again, if I wanted to submit a grant to the National Institutes of Health, I want to study integrative oncology. They said, well, that's way too broad. I said, okay, how about nutrition and cancer? Well, that's way too broad. How about fruits and vegetables? Well, that's way too broad. How about cruciferous vegetables? Well, that's way too broad. How about sulfurophane? You can get a grant to study sulfurophane, but that's not integrative oncology. They're a little bit reductionist over there. No offense, of course. No. <laughs> um, so let's go back to one that you began with in terms of plants. Let's go back to cannabis or marijuana. Yeah. Uh, how did you first encounter this clinically as a, uh, as a treatment or a palliative uh, measure? Well, first of all, I did go to Brown and Stanford and I did inhale, so I can tell you that. And uh, I think I would be a very different person today if alcohol were my uh, recreational substance of choice as opposed to cannabis during my weekend activities. So, so I have some experience with cannabis and, uh, you know, as an oncologist in San Francisco for 38 years, gee, the number of patients that I've cared for who have not used cannabis uh, is is much smaller than the number who have. And, you know, anecdotally, uh, I think that's why dronabinol or Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol was licensed and approved in 1985 as a treatment for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting because uh, the NIH, the National Cancer Institute, and a small pharmaceutical company sort of heard that many patients in the 70s were benefiting from using cannabis at a time when we had very few uh, other agents for nausea and developed the main psychoactive component, uh, Delta-9 THC, into a pharmaceutical. Uh, but, you know, my experience, again, is that Delta-9 THC is not cannabis or marijuana because 
it has, the plant has 400 other compounds in it that all provide the yin and the yang that balances out the Delta-9 THC. So, you know, just from listening to patients and then when we approved uh, medical marijuana in 1996, you know, I started writing uh, letters for patients to be able to access it. And we found that not only is it useful for sleep, but pain and nausea and appetite, depression, anxiety, whether or not it's useful for treating cancer. My, my comment on that is, again, I've been an oncologist in San Francisco for 37 years. If cannabis cured cancer, I would certainly have a lot more survivors. Now that might be smoking cannabis might be different from taking these highly concentrated oils of THC or CBD. But again, in my practice, I only see the people who have not done well on those treatments. Maybe I have a biased practice, but you know, it, one of the most painful things I see are people that waited a number of months to see me as a new patient who are treating a potentially curable cancer uh, without conventional care, but with high dose, highly concentrated cannabis products. And now they have metastatic disease and can't be cured. Oh, I know. I think I've even, I, I recall sending a couple of such patients to you um, too late. Um, on the other hand, though, those who have done well, I think you have said, and I think I, I've heard it a lot too, who attribute it to cannabis in some form have also had conventional therapy, but kind of forget that or just downplay that and, and attribute it to cannabis. That's been my experience as well. I must say that I just had a basal cell removed uh, from my forehead and it's a basal cell that first appeared five years ago. And when it was biopsied and came back basal cell, uh, I started putting one of our cannabis products here on it. Clint uh, wrote the book, Marijuana Gateway to Health, How Cannabis Protects Us from Cancer and Alzheimer's. And he judges for the High Times Cannabis Cup. So we get a lot of donated cannabis products to try. So five years ago, I started putting this cannabis balm on my basal cell and my dermatologist made an appointment for me to have it removed. And when I got to the surgeon, they said, you know what? It's not here. They said, I could do the surgery. I could do a more minor procedure or we could just follow you. And I said, well, why would you do the surgery if it's not here? My thought, however, at the time was that the act of biopsying it released it into my system and my body mounted an immune response and that's what took care of it. Well, it came back and I went to my dermatologist on July 1st and he said, I don't even need to biopsy it. Let's just send you to the surgeon. So it was a shallow ulcer and I started putting the balm on it and it disappeared. The shallow ulcer disappeared. However, when I went back uh, to the dermatologist, I said, I think I got rid of it again. He said, no, it's still there. It was a under the skin little nodule that was less, was four millimeters big. And in fact, I did have it removed and it was a basal cell. So here twice I thought maybe cannabis cured my basal cell, but it didn't. So well, there has been, you know, at least in vitro, there are, you know, studies that show anti-cancer activity. Uh, do you attribute that mostly to CBD or THC? Or I mean, CBD is this huge I know you get not a proponent of CBD, although I tried some last night for sleep uh, just to see, uh, and it wasn't bad. My patients say that CBD is good for sleep. Uh, THC complexes with the so-called cannabinoid receptor, and that's how it does its work. CBD actually is an antagonist, and it actually is, changes the shape of the cannabinoid receptor, so it no longer could get THC, which is why CBD decreases some of the psychoactivity. So the, this receptor, the CB1 receptor, is one of the most densely populated receptors in our brain. And Manuel Guzman, my friend and colleague in uh, Madrid, has a laboratory that studies uh, the effects of cannabinoids on metabolism. And the most metabolically active cells in the body are the brain. 
So Manuel's lab would add cannabinoids to rat brain cells in culture and look to see what effect it had on metabolism. And they said, maybe we could do our work faster if we grew up a brain tumor. So they grew up a rat brain tumor and they added the cannabinoids and everything died. And they said, oh, we must have done something wrong. So they did it again and everything died. They said, maybe this is a bad batch of cannabinoids. So they went back to the normal brain and they added it and everything lived. So since that time, Manuel's lab has really discovered that the THC complexes with the receptor on these brain tumor cells and leads to programmed cell death. In addition, the cannabinoids decrease the development of vascular endothelial growth factor, which allows new blood vessels to form to feed a growing tumor. And they also found that cannabinoids decrease the activity of an enzyme that allows cancer cells to become invasive and metastasize. So that's all very elegant, but it's all in the test tube and in animal models. A very small study has now been done with an under the tongue spray, uh, nabiximols. It's a whole plant extract modulated to have a one to one ratio of THC to CBD. And this, this is a drug that's licensed and approved in Canada, the United Kingdom and the European Union for treating spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis. It's not yet approved in the US because none of the studies done here have shown it to be effective for anything. But in this study, which has not yet been published in the medical literature, although the press release came out in February of 2017, 12 patients with recurrent brain tumors receiving chemotherapy sprayed the uh, nabiximols under their tongue and nine sprayed placebo. And at one year, 83% of the nabiximols group compared to 54% of the placebo group were alive, and that was statistically significant. The fact that it's not yet published is a little bit disconcerting, and the fact that the study only had 21 people makes it less than generalizable. But you know that's the best evidence that we have. So when patients ask me, what should I use, particularly brain tumor patients, I recommend a one-to-one -one ratio, but I'm not sure that that's correct because maybe THC alone would have been better than the one-to-one -one ratio, I don't know. Well, in, in conducting research on this, you uh, lamented before encountering a lot of roadblocks in this regard. So I don't know if this publishing delay is about that, but you know, POT is still, it's a uh, schedule one which means, you know, at least in the official federal uh, jargon that it has no positive impact and a great, a great potential for abuse. So you ran into a lot of roadblocks, it seems, in trying to get more research done and, and, and published and so forth too, right? Yeah, but I looked at those as ultimately as challenges and I decided, you know, the more roadblocks I get, the more I'm going to fight to get over them. And I you know, I have been able to do five or six uh, randomized uh, controlled studies uh, looking at inhaled cannabis in our clinical research center at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General. And again, there is, I believe, a publication bias. Um, my last paper was published uh, just two weeks ago in uh, JAMA Network Open, uh, looking at uh, cannabis versus placebo in patients with sickle cell disease and pain. And it took a while to get that published. Uh, even the editor of JAMA uh, Network Open said, why was this study was completed in 17? Why is it just being published now? And I said, well, you know, there is, I think, a publication bias against studies uh, looking at cannabis. Maybe I'm paranoid or a conspiracy. So this is even though an ever-growing number of uh, mainstream medical associations, et cetera, have called for it to be rescheduled to make research easier. Uh, you and I were co-authors with some other people on a position paper for the state medical association that then got the AMA as well to say, you know, we got to move this out of schedule one so we can do research, but there still is this bias, it seems. There is this bias, and I often wonder if moving it out of Schedule 1 is really going to 
change it. I mean, it'll remove some of the barriers, but you still have to get people interested in studying it. And, you know, my interest is the plant as opposed to an isolated chemical component of the plant. And uh, nobody's going to be able to patent the plant. So, you know, so the impetus to study, and then when you study it, is it going to be inhaled or vaporized or baked or a tincture or what's the ratio going to be? It's really staggering to think of all the complexity of trying to study cannabis in 2020. Mm. I want to ask about another uh, controversial issue that you dealt with early on. So, and this goes back to the dealing with mortality and, and people dying is the issue of choice in dying, physician yeah. assisted dying. Uh, you did one of the uh, early surveys. Um, I actually did the first in this in this country just locally, and then you did a broader one of physician opinion on this, showing a uh, uh, pro-choice uh, yeah. uh, majority in a sense. And uh, so how did you first get interested in that issue? Yeah, well, again, you know, in those early days before we had any treatment that was effective for HIV AIDS, we had all these young, attractive, intelligent, uh, you know, successful gay men who just were watching themselves fade away into these skeletal people roaming in the Castro. It was, you know, really frightening. Everybody knew other people, you know, they got the purple spots, they became wasted, they suffocated from pneumocystis and, and people wanted to have a choice. And uh, I remember John Stansel, one of my colleagues, uh, really called it the good death and orchestrating the good death. And we all figured out that cecobarbital, a barbiturate with some composine and alcohol would take care of that. And, uh, you know, I have to say, as an oncologist for 38 years, the number of cancer patients who have asked me for assistance, I could count uh, probably on one hand. But again, if you're a young, healthy person and you know what's lying ahead of you, in those days, people just didn't want to deal with that and didn't want to burden their partner or their family with the uh, excessive care that it was going to take uh, to help them move on in their transition. So we would write those prescriptions. And then uh, Lee Sloan was a, a, a psychologist who said, why don't we study uh, the consortium and see their opinions on this? So we uh, made up a case or a few cases and submitted, you know, asked people, would you assist? And then I think we did it a second time and we said, have you assisted? And that's what we published in the New England Journal because you know, we found that the vast majority said yes, that they would help this patient. And that 52%, I think, of the respondents said that they, in fact, had written those prescriptions. Which and, is basically, uh, uh -huh. Go on. It's basically admitting to a felony. I mean, it was a big... Uh... <laughs> I guess. I didn't realize that when the New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, published it, that we were outing all these uh, colleagues. But... I, just on a personal level, uh, my partner who died with me uh, wanted to die at home. And it was in 1989 and I was a famous young AIDS doctor and did a lot of traveling. I had his mother come from Kansas City to take care of him uh, one night uh, or one weekend or one week when I was out of town. And she was all of 4'11 and 97 pounds and he fell on the way to the toilet one night and uh, was on the ground in his waist and she couldn't pick him up and so when I came home she said he has to go to hospice and he actually had always wanted the means to end his own life and they were right next to him in the end table next to our bed uh, but he became demented and he didn't know that he still had those means and I couldn't find it in me to do anything. So he went to coming home hospice and 
Uh, I came home again from another trip and I went to see him and he was really out of it and doing all sorts of weird gesticulations. And I went to dinner and I told the nurse, I can't, I can't anymore. It's too much. And I went to dinner with a friend and I got a phone call. You better come back. And so I went back and he died. And I don't know if the nurse helped him along, but it was a blessing. So, you know, I do still believe uh, that this is a not, it's not necessarily a right, but it's a gift. And I'm glad that we have this in this state. I worry about, uh, you know, for myself, because all of my parents have become demented, whether it's Alzheimer's or vascular i don't know and hopefully it's not going to be me but i sure don't want to be that way and currently the way the law is written demented people are not eligible to participate which is unfortunate i think because it's a big cost and it's you know i don't see that life is going to be that pleasant if that happens but yeah well it's interesting at uh, actually grand rounds at a local hospital just uh last year I was one of the speakers on, on this topic and I actually surveyed the audience. And of course this is selection bias. It was, you know, but, but I asked, you know, do you think this should be available in terms of impending uh, advancing dementia and got basically a unanimous yes on it. Oh, good. So I'm not being so controversial. <laughs> no, this was, well, you, it still is. It was a clinical audience. Um, yeah. That's always been the great fear of, you know, the argument here is that it leads to a slippery slope where you have right. to, yeah. Um, so, you know, but we haven't seen that, at least in terms of the reports in places that have legalized it. You know? All right, maybe this should be our next uh, challenge. We can work on that. <laughs> I, you know, um, but I do think, you know, my feeling on this is, you know, as, as you know, this has spread in terms of more states legalizing it around the country. Um, but I have a, you know, I would argue that this is one of the uh, changes that originated here in this area in the modern world anyway, it's been a debate going back for centuries, but in the modern era out of San Francisco and the HIV experience, really. I think that that was a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, again, I think HIV really did model a lot of uh, progressive, uh, you know, self-care and medical issues for, certainly for people living with and beyond cancer as well. Early access and, you know, being part of boards or, uh, committees that are evaluating clinical trials. I think, yeah, I think the activism in HIV really uh, did make a, a profound mark on the way we practice medicine today. Uh, you were once uh, president, I believe, of uh, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association nationally. Um, would you say something about how that, uh, you know, being a gay man, has influenced your own practice and how did you did you run up against obstacles in medicine maybe not in San Francisco so much but uh, you know um, how did that form your your views on on your career and what you've done well I mean that's a really good question uh, I think that I've always felt like I've been in the right place at the right time and again you know since unfortunately HIV was a gay disease when it first started here in San Francisco. And here I was training to be a hematologist oncologist and working in a retrovirology lab. Gee, I mean, what else could I do? So uh, yeah, I think uh, this is a story that I, I need to tell, but I, I'm not very articulate putting it together. Clint, who, as I mentioned, wrote one book is writing another book. And he said, when he finishes that, he'll, he'll do his life story and then we need to do my life story and you know even putting my f folders and files into boxes for the library archivists when i saw things you know in a way i was proud of what i did but also i said oh my god how did i do that and i i think i have a little ptsd uh for what i experienced in the 80s to be honest in the 90s uh, so uh you know but as a gay man i just it was my community and I just felt like it was my calling uh, to, uh, to be there and to do something. I don't know how to answer the question. No, that's an answer.
uh, in terms of the association and the the oh glamma yeah so what what were there what was your primary kind of yeah. goals or focus in that realm right so I was president in the year two thousand so it was after the availability of uh, potent antiretroviral drugs and patients were now no longer really dying and. The organization had changed its name from AFER, the American Association or American Association of Physicians for Human Rights, which they felt was too vague and maybe sounded more anti-nuclear, to the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association just a few years before I became president. So we really outed ourselves, and uh, you know, it was a time where, uh, you know, for me, being a gay man in San Francisco was never. Uh, an issue. Well, let me let me take that back. When I was uh, first uh, working in in the Harold Varmus's lab, and we found out that this disease, this new disease, was uh, due to decreased T lymphocytes. Randy Schiltz from the Chronicle called me and he said, "What's a lymphocyte?" So I told him, and he said, "Can I say that you're gay?" And I said, "Well, why would you need to put?" Donald Abrams gay oncology fellow. When I'm telling you what a lymphocyte is, I don't think my sexual orientation matters. So he said, okay. So then he called me a few years later, what's a retrovirus? And I told him and he said, can I say that you're gay? And, but at this time I was sort of out of my fellowship. The first time I was still a fellow and I didn't want to, you know, maybe risk being a uh, on the faculty by coming out as a gay doctor in the Chronicle. So the second time I said, no, Randy, I don't think it's really relevant to say that I'm gay. And so he sort of ignored me for a number of years and then came to talk to me about his book. And when he came to talk to me about his book, by then I had come out to both of my parents. And I said, Randy, in the book, you can say that I'm gay. And a little tear came down his face. And uh, that was, sort of, you know, I, I guess initially I was a little concerned because I didn't have a secure faculty position that I, you know, because it was still the early 80s. But, you know, since that time, I'm definitely out and uh, I'm a gay man. What can I say? Happy to be here. Well, and you did wind up a full professor and a chief of a department, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. And now Professor Emeritus, because I retired. And I've just been recalled this week to continue my work uh, at the Osher Center in Integrative Oncology. Recalled meaning? Meaning that uh, once at the university, UCSF, somebody once said, stands for you can stay forever. And Julie Gerberding, my dear friend who uh, ran the Centers for Disease Control under Bush II, told me a long time ago, you can't retire, or you'll get bored and sick. It sounds like an old curse. So, and Clint, when he said, why don't you just stop? I said, well, you know, I'm very much defined by what I do. I love it and I help people. So why should I stop? So UCSF allows you to retire and you have to be away totally for one month and then you could be recalled up to 43% time uh, to continue to work. And so I'm doing uh, clinics and group visits Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday mornings. And I'll have all my afternoons free and I have four day weekends. So it's not a bad life. Good schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that is what you're calling at this point, semi-retirement maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but no, I mean it's a it's it's a it's actually I think a very valuable thing because your experience and and skills are so valuable if if you're willing to do it. That's that's yeah. You know, I really I my patients really enjoy uh, an integrative oncology approach. And one of my old uh, girlfriends from Brown uh, is a dermatopatho dermatopathologist in Tampa, and we had dinner. 10 years ago or so. And she told me, you know, you really need to mentor people. You really need to make other people be able to do what you do because it's very important. I think when you see an oncologist who, who, who says, tells you what to, what's good to eat, it's very different from most oncologists who say, it doesn't really matter, eat whatever you want, which is 
totally incorrect information. So uh, yeah, so I, I do in this phase of my career, my goal really is to uh, help uh, younger colleagues uh, learn what's important. And so is that part of formal teaching through UTSF that you're doing? Uh, yeah, I, I do teach a, a cannabis seminar for first year medical and pharmace pharmaceutical students. And then, you know, it's a little difficult now that we don't have physical clinic where somebody could sit in the room with me and a patient. Uh, is it more invasive to have another face on the Zoom screen? I don't know. I haven't actually done, you know, uh, shadowing via Zoom, having uh, interns, residents, fellows, or faculty or, or established oncologists uh, zoom into an appointment with me yet. I do do group visits, uh, and I'll tell you that uh, my, Zoom, my Zoom group visits, patients uh, on the screen seem to be much more vocal and interactive than when they're sitting around the table together. I find that to be an interesting observation. I'm not exactly sure why that yeah, is. Why, why might that be? I don't know. I mean, one of the things, the impacts of this pandemic is in, in medicine is the, everybody's been talking about telemed coming for a long time, but it wasn't really happening. And now it's become the norm, you know, in a lot of places. Right, yeah. You think that's a mixed, uh, possibly a mixed blessing. I mean, it allows access, of course, still in this, in this environment. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's very different from actually being able to see somebody and do examinations and H&P and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, I saw a guy from Mississippi this week, a new patient. So, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I think that part of the uh, intimacy of the relationship between physician and patient is the touch. And I do miss, you know, there's not a real reason that I need to fully examine people when I see them at the Osher Center. Uh, but I do always make it a point, or I did make it a point to lay on hands because I think that's something that's important to do. Yeah. Um, you, you open to a couple, we have a couple questions here in the chat that might be interesting. Sure. One is identified as an old friend of Dennis Perone. <laughs> so oh. Dennis Perone was a pioneer in the cannabis issues sure. here. Um, and I think we know the answer to this. Are we unwise at age 78 to risk heart health in either smoking cannabis or even more so eating it? It's an interesting question. And given that the American Heart Association just did a statement this week, right? Yeah, uh, the, their statement was, I think it's funny that I read your, you sent me one yesterday and the one that I got the day before, they were like two different slams. The headlines, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, Sophie, what's her name, Zoe Lundgren. Uh, I don't watch news, but at the gym when they're used to, we used to be able to go to the gym, uh, I treadmilled and I used to watch the closed caption and Zoe Lundgren apparently uh, is a congresswoman in the Bay Area who's been involved in all three recent impeachments. And they asked her if there was anything different about this one. And she said, yes, we live in an era where the media allows for multiple realities to exist, even when the truth is known. And I like that. Anyway, so that's why there's two different headlines for the same article. So the, the impact, I was one of the 16 members of the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine Committee that published the book, The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids in January of 17, after reviewing 10,000 articles. And on our chapter, in our chapter on cardiovascular health, we saw no evidence that cannabis increased risk. That being said, Cannabis does increase heart rate and it can lower or increase blood pressure. So anybody who has a history of cardiac disease, I would be a little bit cautious. In general, because of the different kinetics of inhaled versus ingested cannabis, I often recommend for people that if they want better control over the onset, the depth and the duration of the effect, inhalation is better to ingestion because when you inhale cannabis the peak concentration of the delta 9 thc the main psychoactive ingredient occurs in two and a half minutes and then dissipates quite rapidly 
when you take it by mouth, the peak concentration appears in two and a half hours and then takes a much longer time to get out of the body. And when you take it by mouth, the delta-9 THC, when it goes through the liver, gets metabolized into an even more psychoactive 11-hydroxy THC. So the effect is more pronounced and lasts longer. So yeah, so if you're 78 and you know want to use cannabis, uh, if you find a product, for example, a tincture, when you put a tincture or an oil in your mouth, some of it is rapidly absorbed from under the tongue and then you swallow the rest. So that gives you sort of a hybrid of the inhaled versus the ingested kinetics. So the tinctures might be the best option. But careful ingested. if you have a prior a preceding history of heart disease. Well, and the ingested route is where you get the majority of what people might call bad experiences, overdose, et cetera, too, you know. Uh, because it's hard to titrate that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I see a lot of older patients with cancer, particularly women who think that eating is good and inhaling is bad. So they go to the dispensary and they say, they're told only eat a quarter of the cookie. And they do and nothing happens. So they eat another quarter and nothing happens. So they eat the whole cookie. And then they call me three days later, perhaps after a visit to the emergency room with a dystonic reaction telling me they're never going to do that again. Plus, Cookies, I don't think, are medicine. Uh, cookies, gummies, these are all sugar. And, you know, in my integrative oncology nutrition teachings, I tell patients sugar is the number one no. For multiple reasons. Yeah. So we, ha we have another question here. You mentioned this one is, you know, you mentioned Tony Fauci. So, um, Given your broad background, what do you have to say about the current pandemic and how we've handled it and what the future holds? <laughs> um, you know, this is that's out of my wheelhouse, but I'll tell you that I did read a book called Pale Rider, which is a you know story of the Spanish flu, and it was from 1918 to 1920. And in 1918 to 1920, we didn't even know what viruses were. Uh, but in reading the book, I was really struck by the similarities in social, political, and economic effects of that virus globally uh, compared to what we're going through now. So my concern is that uh, waves or no waves, that this is gonna be with us for a while. Uh, you know, Clint and I chase uh, total solar eclipses and we're sort of sitting on the edge of our seat trying to figure out if our trip to Argentina in December 2020 for Eclipse 2020 is going to occur or not. I, I'm dubious, but uh, yeah, I, I can't make predictions. I think this whole thing with, you know, our leaders saying one thing and our medical leaders saying another is sort of typical of the politicization of medicine. I mean, you know, that's why cannabis is still not legal because it's politics more than medicine. Well, it's interesting when I talked with uh, Paul, again, Wolverding and Molly Cook, uh, another medical leader, his wife, um, and asked them to, you know, reflect back on the beginning of HIV-2. What they remembered then was that Reagan was president and didn't mention AIDS for years. He wouldn't say anything about it. Um, but in this case, we were agreeing that we wish the current president wouldn't say anything <laughs> about it. By the way, Molly Cook is also a medical leader herself, not just Paul Wolberding's wife. Thank you very much. Well, that's what I said. She was a medical, yeah, she was, a, that's what I. Oh, okay. I thought you said Paul was a medical leader. Okay. No, no. Sorry. Um, very <laughs> much so, yes. Um, a note on the eclipses. I mean, you are one of, there. there's a, a a worldwide uh, band of eclipse junkies, I guess we could call them too. What is it about that, that that draws you so strongly? Yeah, ABC News did a little piece on Clint and I because this, the Oregon eclipse uh, was our 16th and 17th total solar eclipses. And I, I said on that uh, video or broadcast that uh, I think it's nature's greatest spectacle. And when you watch the moon uh, cover the sun, and then at the end, you can see the sun's 
rays, the, the energy of the sun uh, coming out from behind the, the black side of the moon. It's, it's like looking into God's eye and it really uh, gives me a huge spiritual lift and allows me to continue to do what I do. Very powerful experience. And when did you say the next one is, Argentina? Argentina 2020, but we'll have one across uh, the US uh, in 2024, uh, going from Texas to Cleveland. And you know, here I grew up in Cleveland, but Clint says we're not going to Cleveland in April of 2024, because in Cleveland, that's where April showers bring May flowers uh, originated. So we won't have a clear sky. But yeah, there, there's, there's one someplace in the world about every 18 months and we've sort of made that how we take our vacation. And, and we've been to many exotic places. We've overflown uh, the North and the South Poles and we've been on every other continent to see totality. Uh, it's really quite a trip. Oh, well, great, wonderful. Uh, anything else you want to tell us? I'm good, I'm good. All right. Well, um, I think we'll we'll close it off there. I'm very grateful for you for agreeing so easily to do this, and uh, we will uh, get a recording of it and probably a transcript for publication at some point too. So, Dr. Donald Abrams, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks.